Well, it's good to be back. Uh, had a holiday break this last Sabbath, but watched from home. And uh, like Gina mentioned, I'm thankful that we are able to stream our services and and uh, be able to stay connected that way. Um, I don't want to break the spirit of sacredness here, but I I do want to thank Pastor E. John Cluze for the prayer this morning. <laughs> Did you see Pastor E. John? I've been called things before, but Pastor E, that's a whole nother level. That's, I haven't quite earned the Pastor E title yet, but that's a wonderful thing. No. <laughs> Father, thank you, Lord, that we can come here in friendship. We can come here in hopes, Lord, of hearing your voice and to have the courage and confidence to know that you want to speak to us as well. So, Lord, just continue to reveal yourself to us. And may this time that we share together, considering your word, your plan for our life, Lord, I pray that it would be a blessing to us all. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I felt it would be appropriate here at the beginning of uh, the month and as we're going into, uh, obviously, the Christmas season to talk about generosity, uh, the spirit of generosity. And it seems like something that is uh, an assumed value, uh, both within the church and within our culture as we get into uh, the holiday season. Um, sometimes it's worth our time to step back and say, what does that really mean? Uh, what more can we apply to our lives when we think about God's calling to our hearts to be thoughtful of others and of generosity? So that is uh, what we're going to be talking about today. Now, obviously, the kids, I normally have the kids quiz uh, and I interact with the young people. Most of them are over at Children's Church. Um, not all of them. So I generally shift to calling it teen trivia because usually there are more of our teens here. But this is open to any of our young people that are here. Um, I like to have this little interactive time. So I would like to have uh, Toby isn't here. Do we have any trained microphone technicians that uh, can maybe be a participant with me? I like it so people can hear. Pastor, Pastor e John, thank you. Pastor e John and Dini Mark. Deanie Mark. <laughs> uh, raise your hand. We'd love to make it so that the, those watching from home or uh, in the recording, if it goes through the mic, it can be heard better, and it just helps with everyone around. Now, obviously, this is a highly subjective trivia. Um, just in your contemplation of the Bible characters, when, when you think of them, who was the most generous in your opinion? Not just, you know, we think of generosity of like giving money, but just in who gave more, who sacrificed most in their, uh, in their story or in their life. Just think of the, the famous Bible characters, any of our young people here today. Um, you can think of maybe the characters mentioned in Hebrews 11. There's a, the hall of faith there. A lot of them are mentioned for their great uh, deeds and acts of faith and generosity, but it can be outside of that as well. So this is just kind of an open uh, form. I'd just like to hear from some young people. Who do you think, in your mind, stands out as the most generous. Ah, thank you, Nico. Excuse me, Jesus. Okay, I, 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 should have, I should have given some qualifiers there. I appreciate that you went right to the heart of it. Surely God and Jesus is our highest example. I'm looking for uh, non-Jesus people, though. Um, Job. Job? All right. Stephen? Zacchaeus after after he was converted. Zacchaeus, okay, he did. He was generous. He he mentions that in that story. That's a good one. Um, I know we have a, a few others spread throughout. So again, I don't want to leave anyone out. Just put your hand up. I'd love to have you participate and just tell me uh, another Bible. Oh, Adon, yeah. Noah. Noah, that's a good one. I could pin you down and ask you know what the details are, the why, all the the theology. Yeah, yeah. So there's, and there's ways that we can see generosity or sacrifice in so many Bible characters. Come on, anyone else? I know I don't want to point anyone else out. don't want to make anyone uncomfortable. But come on, let's just think about generosity within the Bible stories and characters. There's a couple that should be jumping out to you uh, if you think about it. And again, it's, it's highly subjective. Come on, teens. All right, we're going to allow an, uh, uh, 
an older, older teen. teen. I think Mary. 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 Very interesting. I'll take one or two others. Obviously, this is causing uh, some. All right, another another uh, uh, graduated teen here. We allow that here. Moses. Moses. Well, there's certainly some something about that. All right, Nico, one more, Anna. and then. Oh, I'm sorry, Francis. Anna. Anna. Really, very interesting. Yeah. Esther. Esther. Okay, she prepared feasts, and then, hey, anytime someone's making food, that's generous. I like that. Is there one or two more? Oh, yeah, right back here. The widow with the two mites. The, okay, the widow with the two mites. Jesus obviously says that that was a, a, a remarkable thing that happened there. All right, one more, maybe one more. All right, right over here. Uh, John? Miguel, thank you. Yeah. Nicodemus. Nicodemus, very interesting, very interesting. All right, so we identified a few. Thank you, thank you, John and Mark, appreciate it. You can just set the mics on the front pew if you um, are okay with that. Here are some that, that came to mind. And again, I know if you haven't thought of it, it kind of catches you, you know, off guard a little bit and you're kind of racing in your mind. But I think if we thought about it uh, long enough, we would think Abraham probably would be one of them. I mean, for that single act of him offering his son. Now, uh, when you think of it in the context of a sacrifice, um, not only does, was he asked to offer up his son, but he was asked to be the instrument of, of sacrifice as well. So in other ways, uh, also, we might think of Abraham as being generous. One of the wealthiest uh, people in the Bible, when you, when you think about it, a mighty, mighty chieftain, um, and yet he was asked to give up his son. So I think as, as far as uh, who gave more or sacrificed more, I think we'd have to think of Abraham. Moses, I think, is clearly in, in the running for it, too. Uh, I mean, he's born a Hebrew, but he's raised in the palace. He's literally a prince of Egypt. He, uh, of all, everything we know historically and biblically, he may have had the opportunity to become a pharaoh. He recognizes that he shouldn't be uh, in the Egyptian context. He flees into a, a, a pastoral life and, and, you know, he says, hey, I like farming and shepherding now. And God says, well, I still need you to go back to Egypt. And, of course, we remember the whole story. And it's interesting that in Hebrews, it says that Moses chose rather to be ill-treated by the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. It actually says he chose the ill-treatment, not just of the Egyptians, not just of the desert and the wilderness. He knew or he accepted the reality that he would carry the burden of the stiff-necked uh, Israelites uh, uh, and Hebrews as he brought them out of, of Egypt. So the sacrifice, the generosity of Moses, he, he went so uh, to the point where he, he literally said, God, I can't do it anymore. These people are killing me. Pick someone else. And uh, so I think Moses, uh, through the whole story, he's a major character. Daniel, when you really get into the story, if you, again, when you, a lot of times we think Daniel and lions and Daniel and dreams and uh, you know, Daniel this and that. But Daniel, when you read the opening chapter of Daniel, where we first meet this character, okay, he's a teenager, okay? He's a teenager. His whole world had been turned upside down. Israel is destroyed by the Babylonians. The temple is destroyed. He, we don't know where his family is, but it would lead us to believe he's either separated from mom and dad and brother and sister, or maybe they were killed. My point is he loses everything, when he becomes a captive. And when I say everything, it says he was given over to the care of the chief of the eunuchs. It doesn't go right out and say that Daniel was a eunuch, but I think it asks you to read between the lines. We never read of Mrs. Daniel. We never read of little Daniel and Danielette running around. He probably lost everything uh, aside from his life when he comes over to be a captive. And it says he was of, it mentions that those that were serving in Nebuchadnezzar's court were of uh, the nobility and of the royal line as well. So Daniel may have actually been of the tribe of Judah. He may have actually had the ability to have uh, access to the throne of Israel. So he lost that. Daniel loses everything when we meet him. And yet he shows great faith and courage in his story. So I think as far as someone who sacrificed most, kept their faith, was a, an example 
of, of uh, God's power and grace, I would put Daniel in the running, uh, serving in that environment for the bulk of his life. And then you mentioned earlier Mary. I, I, I've preached on Mary before, and I know you remember that sermon vividly, Jeff, and it's all coming to your mind right now. I think Mary is a fascinating character in the Bible, someone who gave, I mean, we talk about giving our body for, for God. The Bible talks about we need to worship God even with our body and how we care for our body and what we do in and around our body. She literally gives her body to God. She gives her very body and everything that would come along with that, the shame and the accusation and the whispering and all that she would live with afterwards, uh, knowing that this was something of the work of God and probably most people wouldn't believe it and her whole life would be uh, 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 shadowed by uh, the, the, uh, uh, the accusation. So I think what Mary does in the Bible story is equally worthy of considering as an act of sacrifice and giving in generosity. Of course, there's many more honorable mentions here. You can go Old Testament, New Testament, and we could go through why each of them in their own way exhibit a spirit of generosity. So I think it's worthy of considering in the story of the Bible how each has been uh, motivated by God to exhibit this character quality. Now we all know John 3.16 most famous you know, verse, uh, many of us have it memorized in multiple versions and talked about it, and uh, even secular people know John 3.16 to some degree. We all know how it begins. For God so loved the world, right? For God so loved the world. That emphasis of the word so is, is important too. He so loved the world that he did something, okay? He did something. Now, if we were just learning this for the first time, if we were just reading this for the first time, if we were just wondering what it might say for the first time, among some people, they might assume that the next statement would be that he demanded. God so loved the world that he set a list of demands, and he says, you need to obey, you need to be loyal, you need to do what I say, and if you meet those demands, then we're going to have a relationship. And in a similar way, we might say that he commanded. For God so loved the world that he said, here are the commandments. If you follow the commandments, if you do what I ask of you, if you measure up to what I'm asking, then we're going to be able to figure this out and have a relationship. Others, we might think more of the lines of that he regretted. For God so loved the world that he regretted. And this might make us think of the story of Noah that came up. This is kind of the story of Noah. The Bible says that the world was filled with violence. And when God looked at it, it says he relented or he repented or he in some way regretted that, he had, that humanity had taken this turn to the point that it was unredeemable. So within the story, we might say, we might expect or anticipate, for God so loved the Now, did God love the world of Noah? Of course he did. For God so loved the world of Noah, he had a problem. And he regretted, he regretted or he relented or repented or something of that nature, depending on what kind of semantic language we want to use. And so for some of us in our faith walk, we, may not know, we might not think of it this way, but we still live with this mentality that the love of God begins with demands. The love of God begins with commands. The love of God begins with, I'm a disappointment to God. He's regret. I failed God. He loves me, but I'm a sinner, and I know that he has regrets about my life. For God so loved the world, he loved us so much, but he regretted the decisions that we've made. Or he commanded, he said, you got to do this, you got to pay your tithe, you got to live right, you got to do what's right. But we all know that that's not how the verse goes. We all know that that is not the heart of this verse and of the message of the Bible in general. For God so loved the world that he gave. He gave. He loved the world. He loved us. He loved broken humanity, sinful humanity. He loved the world so much that before he made any demands, before there were any commands, before there was regrets or even the contemplation, he gave. And he, what did he give? We all know. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God did not give of his excess. It wasn't like God said, okay, I've got thousands of children. I'm just going to pick one. Where's the runt of the litter? 
Uh, I can sacrifice this one if maybe the possibility of of blessing others is going to be a part of that. God did not give of his excess. He gave of his own nature. The, 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 The way in which the Bible reveals the personality of God is a mystery to us. He and the Son and the Spirit are one God so close in their harmony and unity and purpose that you can't really divide them. The Son is as the Father, the Father is as the Son. When Jesus, when God sent Jesus, He not only sent His Son, He sent a part of Himself. He sent a, a part of Himself in ways that we can only kind of mysteriously try to study and understand. He did not give of His excess or His abundance. He gave of His self and of that which was most precious to him in ways that we can understand. He also did not give us what we deserve. And when you get your paycheck, all right, you've worked hard, and you get your paycheck and you look at it, do you you think, man, my employer is so generous? Man, the generosity just flows from my employer. You've earned that. Now, I'm not saying you can't be grateful for your paycheck. I'm not saying you can't be thankful for your paycheck and thankful that you have work. But at the end of the day, you were owed that. You had an agreement. If I do these activities, you will compensate me for the amount in the way that I have agreed to. There's no generosity there. It is a simple contract. Okay. If your boss adds 10% just for the fun of it, and a lot of people, people do get Christmas bonuses, although that kind of becomes an assumed expectation of employment as well. But you, if you get extra, then you're like, well, that was generous. But as long as you're getting what you deserve, it's not generosity. It's duty. It's obligation. And the same idea is here when God gave, and sometimes in our walk with God, we kind of feel like we deserve it. Oh, God, I know that you gave Jesus, but you really owed him to me. I mean, it's not my fault I have all these problems that I'm having to deal with. So you really owed me, Jesus. And by the way, that type of mentality and twisting of of, of our our thinking of God can create enormous problems in our understanding of grace and the love of God. God did not give of his excess, nor did he give what we deserve. He gave over and above, beyond anything we could ever earn or deserve when he gave us Jesus. But the gospel begins with a spirit of, of generosity. God gave and he gave in ex- he gave abundantly. We all know, uh, you know we talk a lot about everyone views the holiday season different, but in general, the three end year holidays kind of encapsulate uh, what we might think of as the holiday season. Holiday obviously comes from you know originally a holy day. All right, so these are spiritual, uh, 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 you know, manifestations of, of recognizing this time of the year in some way or another. At Thanksgiving, obviously, the name of the holiday, Thanksgiving, it is a spirit of gratitude. It's a way of saying we've come to this point in the year. You know, normally when the harvest would be in a, an agrarian society, and, and we've we've survived the harvest, and we're getting ready for the winter, and we're thankful. It's a spirit of gratitude. When we come to the end of the year, I know it's just a turning of the calendar. We go from December 31 to January 1st. It doesn't feel like it's super religious in context, but the origin of the calendar and of January 1 being the start of the year is religious. It was when Christianity believed and, and that, that Jesus was dedicated eight days after his birth. So after December 25th, you count eight days and it's January 1st. So it was the christening or the beginning of the Christian experience when Jesus Christ was dedicated, okay? And, and by the way, this was just a calendar maneuver. It wasn't uh, uh, chronological. They knew that this wasn't exactly the time frame. They chose this um, for pragmatic reasons. But December, December 31 or January 1 is a time, and we still do resolutions, right? We say, oh, January 1, I'm going to change how I eat. January 1, I'm going to start exercising. I'm going to break this habit, or I'm going to start good habits. I'm going to start hot yoga, and it's going to be wonderful, Okay. We still make January 1 a time of dedication. But in between the two, between the spirit of of gratitude and the spirit of dedication, we have this season of giving. And of course, it's of hope and peace and joy and and, and love. And the entire entire story of Christ, of of course, is, is wrapped up into the Christmas. But really, the idea of generosity 
kind of uh, is, is overarching, the, the wise men bringing the gifts to Jesus, and God saying, I'm giving uh, uh, my son for you. The idea of generosity, the giving of gifts, is a, a core component of the holiday season, and I think we can understand that. What is the spirit of generosity? When we think of it in practical terms, the act of giving, the act of charity, the act of sacrifice, doing those types of things. If it's the attitude, an unselfish person, the thoughtful person, a person who's kind, all right, that's generosity. Other times it can be even in the context of stewardship, sharing, or even investment, okay, the things that we invest in our community or in our relationships and in the spirit of generosity. This is from Wellington College. They had a a large symposium on generosity a few years ago, and um, they shared some things, and, and I, I pulled this quote out of it. To have generosity of spirit is to act with kindness, to be open and willing to share with others without any expectation of receiving something back in return. And very important there, too. If there's strings attached, if there's expectations. Um, now, you can have hopes. I know God gave us Jesus in the hopes that we would accept him, but it wasn't with a string attached, like, are you accepting Jesus? You're not? Well, then I'm, real, I'm ripping him back. Okay, so the hope is always there, but having an expectation of receiving something back is kind of outside the realm of generosity. It means to celebrate the success and efforts of others without envy or resentment, except for the Dallas Cowboys. If, if, other than the Dallas Cowboys, that applies. Okay, we can't celebrate when Dallas wins, but everything else we understand, we don't want to have uh, resentment or envy. Make sense? Doesn't that sound like a beautiful world? A world where people are kind all the time. Nobody cuts in line. Nobody cuts you off. Where you, you, you equally share the success of someone else. And you don't need to be jealous of that success where you can join with the joy of others, and you're invited to be with that. It sounds like heaven, doesn't it? That is the spirit of generosity. Wellington College from England. Just a couple of Bible verses that I think help us on our journey of understanding generosity. The very first, the very first beatitude, one of the very first things Jesus says to a, a crowd of listeners in Matthew chapter 5 I mean, he's done a few things, talking to a, a few small groups, but the very first opportunity that Jesus has to talk to a group of people, the very first words out of his mouth are these, blessed are the poor in spirit. People who'd never heard Jesus before, maybe they heard about this rabbi who had done a few miracles and was being proclaimed as the possible Messiah. They would come, and this is the very first time Jesus can address a great big crowd, and he preaches the greatest sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Mount, and the very first words that come out of his mouth. The very first thing he wants people to hear when they're interacting with the Messiah. The very first thing. Have I mentioned it's the very first thing? I think these things are interesting. I think it stands out. And his words are blessed, happy, enriched, content. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And I wonder how people react to that. I know what I thought I was going to hear. I thought I was going to hear, let's go get those Romans, or, uh, you know, don't listen to those uh, religious leaders that are leading you astray. Some of those things will come in, 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 in later messages. But his very first thing, he says, now, wait a minute. If you want to understand anything about God's plan for your life, it begins with this. You're blessed if you do not consider yourself beyond what you really are. Recognize your lack of, your lack of virtue outside of the mercies of God. You have to start there. You have to start with the recognition of your great need of God. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, Luke, when he records the Sermon on the Mount, he doesn't put the in spirit part. He just says, blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And there's a, you know, you can debate, you know, the, the meaning between the literal and the spiritual, and there's a room for each of those. Do they harmonize? Uh, you know, what is the, the divergence there? But it begins with this, the Christian journey, the Christian relationship with God begins by recognizing that outside of God, you have nothing. 
Generosity begins with appreciating the fact that everything you are, everything that you value, everything that defines you comes from the mercy and grace and creativity and beauty and generosity of God. When you give to others, it's because God first gave to you. Does that make sense? That's not hard, right? Andre, are you with me on this one? Okay. That's why beginning with the poor in spirit is such a pivotal part of the Christian walk. We get to why we're not generous when when we're not generous is because we say, no, that's ours. That's mine. I'm not giving that up. That's mine. I got it. And and, and maybe there's a little bit over here. I'll, I'll flick over, you know, but this is all mine. And it destroys that, that overall spirit that God wants us to have. So he begins with his message on the Sermon on the Mount. Recognize that I have provided everything for you. Outside of that, the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. And all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But I have come to, re- to resolve that. I have come to be generous. And I have poured out my mercies on you. Blessed are the poor in spirit. This very attitude is what is lacking in the last days. It's what's lacking in Laodicea. It's what's lacking today, right? It's the Laodicean attitude that says, no, I'm not poor in spirit. I got everything. I'm rich. I'm wealthy. I have need of nothing. And God says, that doesn't work. That's lukewarm. I got to spit that out of my mouth. You don't realize that you're poor, blind, miserable, and naked. Buy from me gold refined in fire. Get the eye salve for your blindness. Get the white raiment for your nakedness. God recognized that in the last days, we would struggle with that core component that defines the very heart of God. God so loved the world, He gave. God so loved the world that He gave. And if we are children of God, if we are being changed into His image, then so also will we so love the world that we give, not of our excess, not of our abundance, but of ourselves. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, where was he rich? He was in heaven, right? He was the pre-incarnate son of God living in the glorious realm of of, of angels and of, uh, of the presence of the Father. Okay, he was rich, he had every he had everything. Yet for Dave Lounsbury's sake, for your sake, for our sake, he chose to show his generosity by becoming poor so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. He sets the example to accept God's plan of showing generosity. A spirit of generosity is more than just giving of our excess. How many of you have ever, uh, I may have shared this before. I I apologize. I have like three stories and I just recycle them. Um, How many of you have ever been a recipient of a food basket? Any of you ever get a food basket? You might not want to raise your hand because it was, I have. When my wife, yeah, okay, Miguel, I appreciate it, bro. Uh, you know, when my wife and I were poor college students, we didn't have a lot. We had kids and, and, uh, apparently we looked needy (laughs) and we appreciated it. You know, Thanksgiving, Christmas, that's when people give food baskets generally, right? Yeah. Um, so here comes the food basket. Oh, we're here from the church. We're the, I think it was the Pathfinder Club or whatever. Yeah, we just brought you the food basket. And you know what I like? They gave it to us in a, a laundry bin. I like that. So like when the, the food was gone, you got a laundry. You got a laundry. It was very practical. Loved it. They were thoughtful. And, and we said, oh, that's so nice. You know, we got this food basket. And, uh, and, and, and then we looked at the food. Um, have you ever had canned hominy? I didn't even know what that is. I, you know, it's just outside of my cuisine uh, knowledge. Uh, the expired French cut green beans. Uh, the 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 and about a third of the food was expired. Um, things that we'd never heard of before, 
uh, that we were just not your common. And again, don't get me wrong, generosity. But this is what often happens. The people come and say, we'd like to do a food drive. Would you contribute to the food drive? And what a lot of people do is they open up their pantry and say, what haven't I eaten in the last 13 months? What's been in the back corner with the cobwebs that, that uh, you know, we, we, we bought a, a pair of them, we tried the one and it was awful. And it, Oh, yeah, that, uh, that green spaghetti sauce that uh, uh, started out red, but now it's, green, you know, the, those odd canned items. And they, they say, yes, I want to help the needy. Yeah, I'm going to help the poor. Here you go. Canned hominy, Jeff, really? And so, you know, we, we, and this is what often happens, right? You, you, people don't always think, how can I give my best? I'm going to get the Kraft macaroni, Emily, not the generic Kraft macaroni and cheese. That's the best, guys. No. Okay. I'm going to give the best chili, canned chili, not that name brand stuff that's just water, Right? Generosity is of giving more, or not just giving of our excess or the leftovers. When God sent us Jesus, it was the best. Amen? He sent us the best. It's a product of Christ dwelling in us, who was generosity incarnate. And in a very similar statement to what Paul had said in 2 Corinthians, he says in Philippians 2, have this spirit, have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He who existed in the very nature of God did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a bondservant. Jesus was generosity incarnate. And if we have Jesus inside of us, it will be a transforming, miraculous thing that happens in our life where it's not just a, a casual a uh, uh, thing that we just choose to do every now and then, generosity will flow from us. Even when we drive. We think that because we're anonymous when we're driving that we can get away with it, don't we? <laughs> they don't know I'm a Christian. Oh, man, they don't know. So if they do something wrong, boy, I'll let them know they did it wrong. God knows, though, doesn't he? Even how we live our lives is a spirit of generosity, the product of Christ dwelling in us, who was generosity incarnate. He wants us to be the incarnation of generosity, thinking of others first, giving our best. Generosity is counter to our spiritual or to our sinful nature. It does not come natural. And if we are not asking God to do this in our lives, we will not understand it, pursue it, or be successful with it. Or it will be painful rather than a joy. And it should always be a joy to give and to have the Spirit of God working in our lives and be generous. It should always be a sense of virtue and joy. But it is counter. And if we are not nurturing generosity, if we're not praying about it, if we're not focusing on it, if we're not asking God to kill that spirit of selfishness, it will corrupt and it will bubble up and it will affect it will affect our ability to live out this life Gen and this is something I, I i've struggled to find a way to to uh, uh verbalize this so i'm going to let you just work on it yourselves generosity is giving of yourself it is giving of yourself it's not just about money or time or talents or kindness. When you give generously, again, not just what you're obligated to do. And by the way, uh, I noticed this uh, in, in the book Education. It's, it's very clear. Um, Ellen White says when we give to the church, it's not generosity. It's not generosity. It's honesty. Because you have made a contract with God that you understand that everything you have comes from him, and the portion you return to him is what you have accepted. So it is about honesty and integrity when we give back to God. Now, you can go above and beyond, and you can go beyond the amount that you have 
uh, 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 you know, committed in your family beyond the tithe, beyond the 10% and whatever, and you can go beyond that. But in its basic form, your tithes are just your duty. Your tithes is your honest expression of faithfulness to God. And if you treat your tithes as generosity, it does change the dynamic. Oh, I'm being so generous at giving God my tithe. I'm being so wonderful in giving God my tithe. It really changes the spiritual reality of, no, God is saying, I gave you 100%. I'm just asking for 10% back. But when we're generous, it is really truly a giving of ourselves. And the idea or the the, uh, passage that came to me with this was with Abraham. Oops, what happened? Was Abraham, when Abraham is going up the mountain with his son Isaac, And Isaac asks the question, he says, Dad, I I see we're going up to offer a sacrifice. We've got the wood for the altar. We've got the fire. We've got got everything we need. We're just missing the lamb. Where's the lamb? And in the King James Version, Abraham looks to his son. He says, Son, God will provide himself the lamb. Now, modern versions add the preposition for. In the old English, they didn't use prepositions like we do. God will provide for himself. A lamb. But in the King James, I like it because it says, God will provide himself. He's going to give of himself. Who's the lamb? It was the, the ram that was caught in the thicket was the symbol of who Jesus would eventually be. God literally gave of himself. Generosity is giving of yourself. It is you identify yourself with the gift. Again, it's not just about the abundance or the excess or the leftover. This is core. I'm giving of myself. And true generosity is experienced and appreciated when we understand we're giving something of ourselves. And again, I, I, I just encourage you to pray about what that means in your own life. God gives us everything that we are, and then we become conduits of expressing that towards others. Generosity is a defining characteristic of God and therefore of a child of God. It should not be I'm a Christian and I'm generous sometimes. As a Christian, I'm allowing the spirit of generosity to be developed in my life. And it can be manifested in a lot of different ways. Obviously, we give gifts around this time of year. We do charity. In the book Education, just a small passage here, there is an obligation that rests upon every human being. It has to do with the whole sphere of human activity. And again, I, I like this idea that generosity is just not a part of what we are. Yes, we're faithful and we're kind and we're, you know, all these, but generosity has to do with the whole identity of the human activity. Whether we recognize it or not, we are stewards supplied from God with talents and, fac- and facilities placed in the world to do a, good, uh, a work appointed by Him. She goes on later to quote some Bible verses. This is a large passage. I'm just giving a few um, tidbits here. But she quotes these passages that I thought were very appropriate. Seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless. Now, that doesn't mean judge the orphans like judge, like we use it. It means to consider the situation of the orphans. Judge that they have no father. They have no um, um, provider, and therefore you can do that for them. Plead for the widow. Blessed is he that considers the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. The Lord will preserve him, keep him alive, and he shall be blessed upon the earth, right? This is exactly what Jesus said in the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor. And when you consider that, you are blessed upon the earth. That will not deliver him unto the will of his enemies. He that has pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord. Isn't that that's exactly the, the sheep and the goats of Matthew 25, right? When did I do these things for you, Lord? When did I visit you? When did I uh, uh, give you clothes when you were naked? And Jesus said, when you've done to the least, you've done to me. And here it says in the Proverbs as well, he that has pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord. You're doing it as a, 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 a spirit of generosity that comes from God and goes back to God. And that which he hath given, he will pay him again. And then she goes on to say, he who makes this investment lays up double treasure. Besides that which, however wisely improved, he must leave at last. Okay, so the blessings that we exist, that we appreciate on earth. He is amassing wealth for eternity, that treasure of character, which is the most valuable possession of earth or heaven. The most valuable treasure. The most valuable treasure or possession, the treasure of character that we have on earth 
or heaven. So again, I come back right to the beginning. For God so loved the world, He gave. He gave. Lord, let me love as you love. And let me give as you give, as you gave. Pray that you would give me your spirit, a spirit of generosity. Let's pray. Father, we could spend much more time going through stories and verses, examples, illustrations to discover and delve deeper into this principle of generosity. We understand it often at a superficial level and we, we value different ways that we can live within this. But Father, it is so critical that we continue to develop this. And now is the time of year that, that is appropriate and, and motivating to build uh, further and deeper into this character. You were the example, Father, in all of the Bible stories and, and, and as it goes down through history, but primarily when you sent us Jesus, it shows your heart of generosity. You gave the best. You gave abundant. You gave beyond. You gave without expecting or demanding anything in return. You gave with the hope that we would appreciate that gift and be transformed by it. So, Father, help us not to neglect your generosity. Help us to make that a part of our lives that we would also be defined as generous people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. Hope that you can come again next week. Tonight, Pathfinder concert at 5 and the Christmas party shortly after. Hope to see you then. God bless.